2018, great year for the spectral mapping group. We uh, operate out of the Woodall Non-Destructive Testing Laboratory at Tonsley. It's the, actually the black building beside the main library. A lot of people ask about the uh, design of the core library and it has that big rusty front and then all this slanting uh, parapets behind. It's meant to represent the geology of South Australia with our iron focus and then our copper and gold drilling. But the black section is about coal and that's the area where we operate. And we house the High Logger 33, which focuses on continuous spectral mineralogy of drill core. Last year, we also <coughs> hosted the new technology of uh, mineralize from the Swedish firm. So we've had a reached a major milestone this year. We've been going 10 years, and we've got a thousand drill holes in the public domain. All these are accessible through SARIC, as you can see on the right. And SARIC has introduced a new layer, which is off showing now new releases. And with the NVCL, every, um, whenever you click on that layer, you'll see the last three months of uploads. So you can actually keep track of where we're going in our scanning program. One of the things we've been working on is actually reprocessing some of the data that sits in the, in the uh, database. Um, and it may not appear significant when you look at the tray pictures from old and new, the old ones at the top with the black surrounds and the new ones with the white surrounds at the bottom. At that scale, there's no real comparison. I mean, they look pretty much the same. But you zoom in and you suddenly realise that with the new reprocessing, we can actually achieve a lot better resolution on your pictures. So if you're disappointed with your downloads previously, you can revisit your old drill holes and get better imagery. The Mineralize campaign, we finished up uh, earlier this year. They managed to scan 48 holes, which represents 20,000 metres of legacy scanning from within the Core Library collection. They've developed a new mineral logger app which operates on the cloud. They load all our data onto the, their cloud site and you have open access to that data. We also have been looking at how to integrate their data with the High Logger work. So their app looks something like this. And if you um, go to their site, in fact, you can get there from SARIC, just click on one of the drill holes and it'll lead you into their site. You actually have to register, but that's fine. Um, and you can select the particular element you're interested in. You can rotate the tray around in three dimensions. And you can see how the elements are varying as you go down the hole. You can have multiple elements on one plot if you wish. When we come to integrating their data with the high logger data on the bottom plot, we've got high logger data showing chloride species. On the top plot, the curve is actually uh, from the uh, mineral ice, and it's representing the iron Fe203%. But we've colorized it with the domains out of the high logger, so you can start to see there's correlations between the boundaries that the mineral ice identify and those in the high logger. And uh, you can see the monzo, monzo granite separated clearly from the, from the gneiss. So also, this year also we launched a two-year program uh, scanning Olympic Dam core. It's another 40,000 metres of core, which will be 60 holes added to the collection. It will add to the previous 14 kilometres of 30 drill holes, which we did in 2014, and gives us an opportunity to build a 3D model. All this data is going into the public domain. This is a map of where the previous section was, and the little dots that you blue dots are the new drilling. So you can see we're going from 2D to 3D quite nicely. And this is the kind of section that we created last time, showing the mineralogy from the thermal infrared. The other highlight we had is from the Cadman 2 copper deposit. We did a collaborative project with Hillgrove Resources. They're just 40 kilometres down the road, uh, which makes, makes it uh, quite amenable to doing near to real time 
support for their brownfields drilling program. So we did an orientation survey. Uh, as you can see on the holes on the right, these are legacy holes that they had in their collection. We put them all through the high logger, derived a model, and then applied that model to their new drilling. So a new drilling would come to the Department of Pallet at the time. It would leave the mine at 8 o'clock, get to us by 9. We'd have it scanned by 11, be able to have the data processed by 3, and back to the mine by email. So it's a very dynamic um, relationship that we developed with the actual drilling program. The model we developed was based around the um, garnet and andalusite and biotite relationships. We found that uh, when you correlate with the copper in the, uh, in the assays, you could see that the andalusite, although it's prevalent around the mine, it actually is near to proximal, it's not actually within the copper itself. So you can say that's a, a close to proximal zonation. And then, then you get closer, you go, your almondine garnet kicks in. But the almondine garnet changes composition and becomes more iron rich associated with the copper. The biotite also changes to being more iron rich and the chloride as well. So those combinations start to give you a mineral gradient that you can work with. And this then leads to a decision tree that you can work around the mine in, in, a, in a proximal sense. So definitely this is a brownfield around Camman 2. It's giving you an example of what you can do if you've got another deposit similarly. You can develop these trees, decision trees. So if you've got white mica, you're pretty much sure you're a long way from, you're up to 300 metres away from copper. Your andalusite, you're getting in closer, and where the andalusite disappears, you move into almondine garnet zone. And of course, the chemistry of the almondine is changing and you get, as you get more proximal. Your biotite and chloride are more pervasive, but they change their chemistry as you get closer to the copper. So the coming year, uh, in 2019, we're going to be working with extending the IOCGU work and we've done a massive campaign already over the last 10 years, been a huge focus on the Olympic domain, something that's been dovetailed in with uh, Adrian's geochemistry work uh, and we're hoping to extend that work. The gold system uh, focus is going to pick up this year, uh, especially after considering how, would, how well Tarkula has, has, has gone. And we'll be doing infield scanning around known gold deposits to see if we can develop the same kind of model that we've managed to do at Canman 2. The uh, GSSA is doing this Flinders to Fowler, which is one of the fairways that they've been discussing. And we will be scanning as many of those holes as we can between now and 2019. I thought that was a fairly good target uh, set to us, but there's a lot of work to be done to, to achieve that target. Of course, the Olympic Dam work is going to be ongoing because that we're only um, three shipments into a, a long program. Um, so we've gone about uh, 6,000 metres of a 40,000 metre program. So we've got a long way to go there. And one thing that's been asked for quite a lot is called something called the Atlas of Alteration Systems. So people are saying, we've got all this data. What we need to do is develop some uh, program uh, explanations and reports about particular deposits and how high logging and uh, the spectral geology can actually assist in identifying particular deposits in South Australia. Thank you very much. <laughs>